I'm so honored to welcome to the stage my former boss, my friend, <laughs> Vice President Al Gore. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Those pictures are yeah, pretty funny. Huh? Yeah. I had a woman come up to me in a restaurant and say, you know, if you dyed your hair black, you'd look just like Al Gore. <laughs> and uh, I was reminded of that by those pictures. Uh, so I'm just so excited to be here with you. And, you know, I've watched you throughout your career, decades of fighting and winning and losing, go pushing through setbacks and leading, leading us all. I'd love to hear about your leadership journey hmm. and any lessons you have for all these social innovators out there in the world who are going to face setbacks like you've, you've faced, and how do you keep pushing on to change the world the way you have? Well, thank you, Don. And uh, before I answer your question, uh, let me say congratulations to the Skull World Forum on 20 years of changing the world in a remarkable way. This is a wonderful gathering, and I want to thank Jeff Skull for setting it all in motion. Um, gee, I don't know quite how to answer that question except uh, to say that uh, I learned uh, at an earlier stage in my life to realize that when you have some kind of setback or some kind of uh, problem that really just seems overwhelming, it, it's, um, it's healing to remember that when you walk down the street, you're walking past people who are carrying incredibly heavy, heavy burdens. Uh, and there are so many people, no matter what you're going through, there are so many people who've been going through so much worse and they bear up, and, and they just keep going. And so um, that kind of gives you a sense of perspective. And I had a teacher um, when I was young who uh, said something that stayed with me all my life. He said, we all face the same choice in life over and over again. It's the choice between the hard right and the easy wrong. And um, I've uh, recognized that choice a lot of times, and I've learned that uh, everybody has that little voice, you know, and I've learned that it's always a mistake to ignore that little voice, <laughs> always. And sometimes we do it anyway. Yes. But uh, anyway, you just, uh, you know, pick yourself up and keep going. It's the only thing I know to say. You know, it's... I've watched you do this in the climate world, and I'm, I'm sure a few people here might want to hear your views on climate, so we, we'll get to that. But talk to me about how you brought people together around this issue, because we can't solve it alone. So talk about both the need to collaborate to solve the climate issue, mm -hmm. and then where you see it all heading. Well, my most important collaboration was with Jeff Skoll. <laughs> I was given a, I started giving a slideshow. Uh, first of all, I gave, I, I used uh, Kodak uh, slides, you know, and they, and, and then I, I got advanced and I, I, I got a system that had three projectors and, a, and the slides would come in and out and I thought, <laughs> wow, I got it now. That's the cat's meow. As Steve Jobs said, Al, you know, we've got these things called computers. And uh, so, so then I, I, I was able to evolve the slideshow more quickly and more effectively. But I was still showing it to like, you know, 50 to 100 people at a time. And uh, Jeff Skull said, you know, you really ought to make a movie out of this. And I, uh, as dumb as I was about the entertainment industry, at least, uh, I thought that was a terrible idea. I really did. I'm not making this up. <laughs> And uh, I, I did not realize the kind of talent that Davis Guggenheim and the others uh, who made the movie had. But Jeff made it possible to, to show it not to 100 people at a time, but to millions of people. Uh, and then uh, I took all the profits that would otherwise go to me on that and put them into the Climate Reality Project and started training grassroots activists around the world and Jeff has stayed with me all the way through that and thank you, by the way, Don, for that as well. 
We're in the last day of a virtual training today, the, this evening, uh, U.S. time. We've got 8,200 uh, people going through a, an intensive uh, four-day training on how to quickly implement the provisions of the new climate legislation in the U.S., the Inflation Reduction Act, it's called, um, and the climate provisions of the Infrastructure Act. Um, we'll have trainings uh, in Ghana later this year and South Korea later this year. Um, and so uh, the good news on climate is that this legislation is remarkable. Uh, it's, uh, it may end up putting a trillion dollars in the U.S. into climate action. Uh, other nations, including the EU and Canada, are now uh, taking up the challenge instead of just complaining, well, you may have violated this trade law or that trade law. They're saying, okay, we're going to match it. And so there's now emerging what I hope will be a race to the top. By the way, Jeff Skoll just sent me an article that I had missed uh, uh, early this morning. Uh, the BBC had an article saying this year for the first time, the greenhouse gas emissions have started to go down at, at, at long last because uh, the number one source is electricity generation. And last year, 90% of all the new electricity generation was renewables. Uh, and it, it's going to be, you know, it's going. And second biggest source is transportation. Electric vehicles are now beginning to, to uh, they're poised to take over the, the market. Uh, and, and there's so much more work to do. So there, there is good news. Um, and, and we had a great election uh, in uh, Brazil to uh, you know, protect the Amazon. And we had a great election uh, in Australia to, rev to turn their uh, climate policies uh, around. But, uh, you know, it's a, the fossil fuel companies, uh, not all, but m most are still purveying these misleading messages, and they have a, a hammerlock on the political systems of so many countries. It, it's really a, a continuing struggle. But um, I'm optimistic. I choose to be optimistic. I think we are going to prevail. Uh, and I think that uh, the grassroots activists, uh, quite a few of whom the Skoll Foundation has, has uh, empowered and brought together, uh, I, I think that's where the change is going to come from. And, of course, Mother Nature is the most persuasive advocate now. These, uh, these climate-related uh, disasters are, you know, every, every night on the network news is like a nature hike through the book of Revelation, and people are saying, you know, uh, <laughs> maybe uh, we need to do something about this. And, and I just can't. <laughs> yeah. We are here because of you. Uh, that BBC article wouldn't be here if you had not woken the world up. So, just a well, round of... Well, I don't of know about that, but thank you, all, all of you all. But, you know, the hard part comes next because they're not going to give up easily. This is really... Uh, we, we've got to win this. I couldn't agree more. Back when I worked with you in those younger pictures, there was this new thing called the internet and technology <laughs> that was getting created. And back then, at least my view, was we were unleashing this incredible tool for democracy and uh, to help lift marginalized voices. I don't think any of us foresaw where it was going to go, as Maria just described. How do you think about that challenge now and what we can do to start addressing rebuilding democracy and, and uh, rethinking how our information ecosystem works. Yeah, in order to solve the climate crisis, we're going to have to address the democracy crisis. Uh, and in order, to, um, in order to meet that challenge, we, we have to pay attention to what's happened in our information ecosystem. Uh, both Maria and Carol are, are heroes uh, to me. Uh, and. Uh, Maria talked about the rabbit holes. The, the rabbit holes that people are drawn down, they're, they're sort of like pitcher plants, you know? <laughs> people try to get out and they just slip on down. And at the bottom of the rabbit hole, that's where the echo chamber is. Uh, and, and when you're in the echo chamber for long enough, uh, it produces a new form of AI, not artificial intelligence, but artificial insanity. And they, they weaponize artificial insanity 
And that's why the, you know, the guy goes to some, he drives 500 miles to a pizza shop in Washington, D.C. and takes out his gun because he thought there was, you know, some kind of conspiracy in a basement of a building that doesn't have a basement. That was our local pizza shop, too. Oh, so, yeah. uh, so it, I mean, it's worth remembering that in the early decades of the printing press, it was pretty wild then, uh, too. And there is a chance uh, that this will settle out and uh, people of goodwill will find uh, corrective measures. I don't want to put out what they call toxic positivity. I mean, it's not going to fix itself. Uh, but there is, there is some hope that, that, uh, that this will settle out. But, I, you know, I think that we need uh, legislation uh, and... I was glad that the Biden administration uh, just uh, put forward some ideas uh, earlier this week. Um, it, it, it won't be uh, easy, of course, but and now with uh, artificial, with generative AI and Chat GPT uh, four and five is coming out in December, and uh, it, there's a real race now uh, on uh, generative AI. That's another whole subject I don't want to divert, but I think that uh, we have to reclaim the integrity of our ability to communicate with one another uh, and to discern what is more likely to be true than not in a collective process of deliberation. You, you know, in, 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 our, in our neurosystem, in, in our brains, the, the, uh, the fear mechanism uh, can drive behavior. And that's why, as they were saying, anger spreads more quickly. The, the pathway in the opposite direction from the neocortex back down is a, is a much narrower pathway. But that's why we have to aggregate uh, 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 with one another through communication and collective decision making so we can lift up the truth as we can best collectively discern it. And we have to remember that diversity is one of our greatest strengths in, in, in in getting at what's more likely to be true. I'll tell you a quick, quick story if please, you'll. If you'll please. There's a, a telescope in the Hawaii on top of one of the mountains called the Kex. Uh, and, and bear with me, they, it's still the most powerful telescope. Well, the James Webb is the most powerful now, but, but uh, in looking at supernovas, and they innovated incredibly in the design of this with the segmented mirrors of the kind that James Webb now has and mathematics to try to paint the atmosphere transparent. But here's one of the innovations. They did two identical telescopes, 60 meters apart. And here's the point I'm, I'm driving at. Even if they're looking at a supernova 100 million light years away, the fact they're, that they're looking at it from two points of view, 60 meters apart on the surface of a small planet, makes all the difference in the amount of information and meaning that can be gleaned. Now, when we have different points of view because of our ethnic, gender, orientation, religion, uh, ability, disability, all of the, all of the differences that we often point toward when we think about people. They are all incredibly valuable in giving us an ability to see what we're looking at with more than our own eyes and get more meaning as a, as a result of our collaboration. So diversity uh, is not just a, a, you know, a woke uh, principle that people just say, oh, well, we should be for this. It's essential to the quality and integrity and efficacy of our collective self-governance. <laughs> During that answer, I was reminded why it was so scary to work for him, because he's... <laughs> So much smarter than the rest of us. And I learned so much from you. And thanks for the job you did in South Africa, too, well, by the you. way. Had a thank you. Time. We had a great time. He came and visited, and I took him to his, a rugby game. So we had a good time with that. Um, it, your last answer reminded me, and we talked a little bit about this backstage. Your home state of Tennessee has ah. seen some interesting, uh, very sad 
activity. Just talk about, because you knew the people involved. Very, very, very well, particularly young Justin Pearson, the legislator from Memphis. Um, and I, I'm remind, and, and Justin Jones from Nashville, and the 60-year-old white woman from Knoxville, who I'm the Tennessee Three. I mean, what a fantastic group. Um, you know, in my faith tradition, there's an old saying uh, that comes from uh, Moses in the coat of many colors when he was thrown in the pit by his jealous brothers. And the saying is, uh, man intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. What happened to those uh, two legislators that were expelled was intended to be a, a terrible blow against them and their cause, but it ended up coming back as a, a, an incredibly uh, redemptive uh, 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 event. And the, the conservative Republican governor of Tennessee just yesterday uh, surprised people by saying, you know, I think maybe we ought to have a red flag law and we ought to have better background checks. And kidding. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not kidding. So, so sometimes uh, these events can turn out differently than their authors intend. So young Justin Pearson from, uh, Justin Jones was great. He got his start removing the statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest, the Confederate general who founded the Ku Klux Klan, from the Capitol building, and then he went on to be elected. Justin Pearson started as a climate activist and as a climate justice advocate. And three years ago, I worked very closely with him. I've been on the phone with him quite a lot over the last two weeks, by the way. Uh, but they wanted to put a high-pressure oil pipeline through Memphis from the Permian Basin in Texas and New Mexico all the way across the Mississippi, they snaked it through a 97% black community, uh, a freedman's community established in 1865 by freed slaves, uh, and right over the aquifer that provides 100% of Memphis's drinking water, right through the extraction zone that gives water to that part of the black community in an earthquake zone, uh, absolutely in insane. It was a reckless, racist, Ripoff, and young Justin Pearson rose up from the community's early 20s, uh, and then later, after that successful battle, w w he was elected to the state legislature. We blocked that pipeline. It was a great victory, but but yeah, thank you, uh, and and Justin deserves a, a lot of the credit, uh, and the two young black women who worked with him, uh, and. Then the state legislature, because the fossil fuel industry has control of them, they passed a state law saying from henceforth, no county, no city, no town in Tennessee will ever be able to block any fossil fuel infrastructure from now on by state law. So, you know, uh, when you win a battle, you got to keep your focus and win the next battle after that. But you pile them up, and pretty soon you're making some real progress. And Justin, both of these Justins are destined for leadership, in my opinion. Well, I, I could talk to you all day, and I know people could listen to you all day, but the little red light's going off on us. So uh, I just want to thank Vice President Al Gore, his third forum, for coming back and spending time with us. Thank Thanks you to so you. much. Thanks to the Skull Forum. You're Thanks, awesome. Buddy. Thank you. Thank you.